we have with us Mr. Jayesh Chakravarti from Fidelity Investments. Jayesh Chakravarti is the country head for the IT division at Fidelity India. He is responsible for executing IT engagements for Fidelity globally as well as leadership development. So I was told by uh, your folks that uh, you would like to know a little bit about the financial segment, the international markets yes. uh, and things related to that. So I'm happy to sort of take you through a one-on-one on, -one on uh, the financial segment. I myself am new to this industry, being here for the last five and a half, six years. But I learned one thing, if, if I had known that this is how financial industry would be, perhaps I would have dropped out of school and joined them when I was 18 or 19. It's a good industry, it's a sort of a roller coaster ride. Uh, lots of successes, huge successes, rewards and bonuses. But also, uh, you can fall into an ages, as uh, everybody found out a year or a year and a half ago. Uh, so let me spend the next 15 or 20 minutes talking to you about the industry. Feel free to interrupt me to ask questions, and after that, we could have a nice discussion. I have a flight to catch, so we'll have a hard stop at 6.45, if you don't mind. But I'd be happy to give you, share with you my number and email, and you could always be uh, in touch with me should you have uh, any further communications. So, uh, how many from financial services industry? Good, that's nice. So, you'll keep me honest as I go forward. Uh, someone told me recently that uh, when I was in Boston, which is where Fidelity is headquartered, uh, the question was what is the difference between a portfolio manager and a pigeon? And the answer was, a pigeon can still make a deposit on a brand new BMW. <laughs> that uh, sort of summarizes the state of affair of what happened to the financial industry last year and the year before last. Uh, broadly, when you talk of uh, financial industry, uh, you have a number of, you have banks, which you're all very familiar with, and you have non-banking financial institute, which consists of insurance companies, investment banking, which falls into the non-banking part of it, mutual funds. Within insurance, you have annuity versus life insurance. Uh, you have payment systems and payment companies like Visa's and MasterCard. This together uh, constitutes what is called as banking as well as non-banking financial uh, industry as a whole. Broadly, they can also be divided as the buy side and the sell side. Uh, mutual funds, for example, Fidelity is the largest mutual fund company in the United States and arguably in the world, is on the buy side. Where I mean, it takes the name buy side because you end up investing money to buy for clients most of the time. The sell side firms, which are many, like Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley's, etc., are those which deal with securities, with trading, with investments, and so on. Higher risk, therefore, higher rewards. Uh, so which are the top 10 banks in the world which you know, uh, just to create some amount of uh, uh, communication and talk? City Bank, it used to be. Yeah. HSBC? HSBC. So what is the difference between a City Bank and a JP Morgan? Uh, great enthusiasm. If one of you would stand up and answer, it. go ahead. Right, right. Uh, Citibank is a retail bank. It started as a retail bank, and uh, that's a very good start. Uh, we would look at some of the acts and uh, regulations which were which came into being and which got repealed called the Glass-Steagall Act and so on, which said in the early days that if you are a retail bank, you shall remain only a retail bank. You won't take money and do investment banking. Somewhere along the line, people got a little greedy, and the same bank became a retail bank, it became an investment bank, it became an insurance arm, it became a payment system, all of that, and as a result, you found that there were no Chinese walls separating them. And uh, you became the uh, 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 you you sort of became the judge and the jury, uh, doing all kinds of work. Some of them contradicting, some of them conflicting with each other, which resulted in the uh, debacle which we saw two years ago. What are the other uh, uh, financial services companies which you're familiar with? 
Uh, let's go to Europe. Which is the largest bank in Europe? RBS. Standard Chartered. Deutsche Bank, very large. Barclays. Barclays, UBS. The good news is, if you have a quiz on this, everybody would be right. Because the question is, who was the largest before 2008? And who had the largest post in the bank? And, uh, how do you decide whether a bank is large or not? What? Tell me one or two parameters. I mean, market cap in terms of your public company. Anything else? Market Market reach. Market reach. Assets and the management, which is a very important term. We call it AUM or AUA, asset and the management or asset and the administration. And that normally for a large bank uh, as large as uh, let's say Deutsche Bank and so on runs into trillions of dollars, very, very large. And if you, uh, have a, if you need to have a sense of what a trillion dollars is, the GDP of the country, uh, India, on a yearly basis is 1.3 or 1.4 trillion dollars. And if you take a company like Fidelity, which is a mutual fund company, at any point, you would have asset under management of, say, three trillion dollars. Uh, mind you, that's not the company's money. It is the money which has been collected through retail, institutional, and other channels for investment in mutual fund. And therefore, we are custodians of that money, but it doesn't belong to us. What other metric would you look at? Asset under management, we talk of market capitalization, reach, which somebody talked about in terms of uh, distribution and reach across the world. Yes, transaction, especially now that you have. Uh, a broking companies on the net. Give me an example of a broking company on the net. Very famous. ICICA worldwide. ING. ING. Charles Schwab, for example, is very, very large. Ameritrade is very large. What the names you gave are also large, but when you look at total volumes of a million or two million transactions a day, you would find these kinds of sell side brokerage and securities companies very, very large. And one of the changes that has happened over the last couple of years is huge amounts of retail business has started coming through the web. Uh, therefore, which makes IT very, very important for banks. To give you an example, the Fidelity.com, and when you have the time, just type in and go to that. Uh, there is about 1.7 million hits per day uh, in Fidelity.com, and over 500,000 trades which happen through that particular website. Now, what does that mean to an IT professional? I mean, yeah. The first thing that comes to your mind is availability. So it's like a bakery. If the bakery is shut down because of uh, a communal riot or a bun, the bread becomes stale and it can never be used again. The same thing happens in banking and mutual fund that you can't afford to have your website down even for a couple of seconds because every second it is down, every second its response time is bad, you can quantify the loss for the organization because somebody is coming there feeling dissatisfied and going elsewhere or delaying or postponing their investment decision. So net banking and uh, rich internet interfaces have made uh, internet a very, very important channel. And because of that, there's a great deal of what we call disintermediation. Meaning that in the past, you would do your financial investment through middlemen. You would have registered investment advisors, you would have brokers, you would have agents, and so on, commission agents. Today, you disintermediate. You come directly to the company and make that investment. And therefore, you save on time, you save on the middleman commission, and therefore, it becomes more uh, efficient. Any questions so far? Any thoughts or questions? Good. Then, uh, broadly, if you look at the market segment uh, for financial services, we classify it in a somewhat funny way. We have the ultra high net worth individuals who form the top of the pyramid. Uh, below that, we have the high net worth individuals or community. Then we have mass affluent. It's very interesting that the definition of a mass affluent is a person who has a million dollars, or about four and a half crores. I thought it was very funny when I first uh, uh, found that definition. Below that, you have low income, and then you have the microfinance, which is the, uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, 